And look, what's next for NCOI now with the apprenticeships? Well, we have registrations closing in March. So okay. um, if you're listening, get on to the website. It will be the end. 30 days of September, if you don't know about 31. There we go. Okay, so I'll try to get this out before then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so we've, we finish up now again, come here. If there is any late applicants, just, you know, uh, go on the website, look for my contact details and contact me. We, tr we, we try and not have any barriers in front of people. We want everyone to be... To, to get it right um so registration closes at the end of march and um, candidate details will be going to employers in april hoping to get the employers employing from may onwards yeah. and then a uh, new academic year starts 2024 uh, we need to embrace and foster a culture of failure like i follow stephen bartlett and he talks about that all the time about just wanting to fail because if you don't fail you won't know. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Fail forward, like that's yes. what they say, right? And I think, especially now in the world of media, that we have so many uh, great insights and leaders and people out there that you could just tap into that knowledge straight away. Yeah, because it was actually Daniel, the video that said to me last week um, that when he he was from he's from Clare. Oh, sorry, Daniel, <laughs> but uh, he's from Clare, and he was saying like when he was growing up, everything was about getting you know if you don't get the points you're leaving here, there's a PLC course to get the college. Great. Um, but there was no talk of apprenticeships. Like, no. It was like, don't take an apprenticeship. This week, I was joined by Dara, the Apprenticeship Coordinator at the National College of Ireland. In this episode, we discussed the various finance and recruitment apprenticeship programs available through NCI. We also delve into his experience as a recruiter and the insights he gained from the recruitment apprenticeship degree. This episode was brought to you by Top Drawer Talent, the supply chain of procurement recruitment specialist. Here we go. So today I'm joined by Dara, who is the apprenticeship coordinator with NCI, the National College of Ireland. And today we're going to discuss the different apprenticeships that, uh, or the different apprenticeship courses that NCI offer, and then your experience as well, completing the recruitment apprenticeship. Yep. So yeah, look, who is NCI and what are you guys doing in terms of apprenticeships? Well, thanks for having us here. It's a great pleasure. Um, yeah, so as you said, my name is Dara. I'm the NCI uh, apprenticeship coordinator. Um, in National College of Ireland, we're actually the... Uh, national provider for financial services um, in apprenticeship programs. So we launched that in 2017. And uh, we've got two programs within the financial services. And now we actually uh, also run the recruitment executive level eight bachelor's uh, degree. It's the first degree in the world to recognize recruitment in higher education. And um, that was spearheaded by the Employment Recruitment Federation and National College of Ireland. And um, that launched in 2020, three year program. Um, and we have now a full cohort. So I actually graduated in November of last year, being one of 16 force in the world to uh, obtain that degree in recruitment. Um, so in, a, in kind of the grand schemes of things, I uh, was in recruitment for four years prior to joining the National College of Ireland. Before that, I was in hospitality management, 12 years, lived in Spain, Toronto. Living the dream. Living the dream, <laughs> literally. Jump, jump ship for a while and then, and then came back home as we all do. Yeah. Um, fell into, you always know, say, fell into recruitment um, in that sense. But uh, I think it was a natural progression going from hospitality, you know, 20 years old. Hospitality was great, the buzz of everything, living abroad. But then when you get into your late 20s, early 30s, the lifestyle just didn't suit me. It was yeah. too, too late, okay. You'd never seen family. Um, and I wanted a nine to five, Monday to Friday job. And I just stumbled upon hospitality recruiter and read through the job spec, read through the duties, responsibilities, and kind of matched my skill set with it. And I said, oh, I okay. can do that. Yeah, yeah. Gave it a shot. Um, and here I am now talking to you. Yeah. So it's <laughs> been a wor whirlwind yeah. ride. You, you went NCI long now, are you? Since uh, August. August. So I okay. uh, graduated there in November. Um, and with the, with the recruitment, you know, recruitment is a, is a great game. It's, it's yeah. it, you have your highs, you have your lows, but every day, <laughs> every day is different. I was a hospitality temp recruiter. Okay. Yeah, so so busy world. as you know, you've got your, you've got your contract recruitment, you've got your permanent recruitment, and then you have your temporary recruitment. So I had my daily roster, weekly okay. roster. So I had about 70 to hundred temps out every week. Um, but once I started kind of college and I, I started going back into education, I kind of found my passion for education yeah. um, and just the learning and, and how it kind of could change and knowledge being power. Okay. Um, and in my previous company, I wanted to get into an L&D role, but there was no progression. Okay. Then I seen a role within NCI um, about apprenticeships. I already had done it. I was about to graduate um, and I just wanted to kind of go in a different direction okay. and see if in a way, could I help somebody else get into the position that I'm in now? So yeah. it's it the same recruitment, kind of space recruitment is a huge industry. Yeah. Um, but at the end of the day, you're just really kind of helping people okay. progress or, 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 or do better. Yeah. And look, someone that's looking for an apprenticeship now uh, or looking to join one of the NCI mm. 
apprenticeship programs, it's finance and recruitment. Yes. So how would someone go about applying for the financial recruitment mm. apprenticeship? So with or the sorry, the finance yeah, apprenticeship. Yeah, financial services, yeah. So um, we have two programs. So we have a level six horror certificate. Okay. It's uh, aimed broadly at uh, school leavers. Okay. So if anyone say looking at their CAO and they don't know what to do um, and they want to get into the financial sector, we have an apprenticeship for them. Okay. Um, we have then the level eight, it's a higher diploma, um, but you would need a minimum of a 2.2 degree to get into that. Okay. Um, and they, I'll go through the differences now, but the, with, with the level six, as I said, it's kind of aimed broadly at people that either want to change career, yeah. are coming back into the workforce, have just left uh, as school leavers that want a career in financial services, so it goes through. Um, financial markets, it talks about, uh, you know, uh, customer service, work-based learning. Okay. Um, so it's a, a tip in your, getting getting your toes wet, getting into, into financial services. If they wanted to get onto that course, you go into National College of Ireland website, okay. you click study, then you'll see apprentices, pr apprenticeships, and then we'll have our courses. So yeah. for the financial services, you'll go in, you'll see the course and you click apply. Yeah. You'll register with the college and then they'll just ask you for some documentation because with the higher certificate, you need to have a past or leaving cert okay. and it's especially maths and English so you have to have I think it's a 06 or H7 I'm not too sure of the new yeah. the new structures of the leaving cert uh, points okay. um, but it's a pass on the leaving cert yeah. um, or if you did have experience in if you were a mature student and you had experience within the financial services you can go in through an RPEL application which is a recognised prior learning so we could say look John has been working in some company for four years. He's a great candidate. So we can get him in that way if he hadn't got a leave insert. So this, we don't like to have barriers in front of education. Yeah. Um, so on the website, study, apprenticeships, apply. Same for the level A. Um, but with the level A higher diploma, it's specialised in data analytics. So it's a bit more of a specialised higher diploma. Okay. Um, and you would need that degree because the level of learning going in there, um, you're going more in depth with, uh, you know, data management, uh, cyber security. So it's a little bit more specialised in the higher diploma. So you'd need to have that level uh, behind you yeah. to be able to succeed. Because you wouldn't want someone going into into a programme that is going to be out of their depth. Yeah, yeah. So we're trying to make sure that there's, uh, there's so many platforms for people to get in, but we're also being mindful of their own journey as well. Because okay. you wouldn't want them to go in and then being overwhelmed and swamped and not being able to do it. Yeah. And with the level six, right, so is that, you know, learn and earn kind of thing? Like, you know, yeah. you... you are you one day a week in college or are you two days a week in college? Like, how's that working? The structure. So, I'll, so when you apply to National College of Ireland for these apprenticeship programmes, um, your details will come to us. Yeah. Um, we are engaging employers at the moment. Um, our registration is open at the moment. Yeah. If we can get a little tag, open now, open now. <laughs> uh, so that's open at the moment. Uh, it will close at the end of the month. So we do okay. give a bracket of, of three months. I think we've got uh, 100 plus applicants at the moment, which is very, very strong. Okay. I've seen the, the level of people coming to us, which are extremely strong as well. It's so mixed. Um, and one thing that COVID brought us was the ability to reach people in different uh, counties. Okay. Yeah, so it's not primarily nice. Dublin. You know, um, you could be in Galway. I think one of the, we've got an apprentice that is from Valencia, Ireland. Valencia Island from Kerry. We've got one from the Iron Islands over by Mayo. Brilliant, yeah. Galway. And um, so what COVID gave us the ability was is to do like an, a blended learning model. So we have online classes, but then we do ask them to come into the college as well. Okay. Um, how so, many days? Sorry, how many yeah. days are you in college, and then how many how many days of distance learning? So you can obviously do it no, from yeah. So what what will happen is your details will come to me. I will then release your details to engage in employers, and the employer will then reach out to per, uh, potential apprentices and offer them interviews. So once they get an, an interview with the employer, the employer will then offer them a, t a fixed term contract for the apprenticeship program, be it two years. So then you say, uh, you start your journey with the employer and then you're about to start your journey with the college and education. Right. So you work four days a week. Yeah. It could be maybe say you're in college on a Wednesday. So you go to work Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. Right. You're in college on a Wednesday. So that's your protected study day. And all the employers as well have all signed agreements to say that that's your protected study day. I know from recruitment, especially on the temp desk, you're, check, you're looking at your check phone. Text messages. Has somebody <laughs> gone to have you turn up for their interview? Where are they? She hasn't turned up for work. I need to get cover. But, you know, the, the employer has signed an agreement say, look, John is not here today. He's in college. Okay. We'll get Patrick or we'll get Susan to cover the desk or to, to whatever the job may be entitled yeah. to, co to cover them. So four days with the employer, one day with work, and that's over the academic year. So right. if you start college in September, you might finish in December. 
You right. work full time till you go back to college. Okay. And then you go back to the four and one model. Okay. Once then you get to summer, um, you know, you're full time in work. Yep. So you're you say first year in the higher search will finish in May. You don't start back second year till September. You're working five days a week. Okay. Um and you're getting a salary as well. Yeah. Sure. So so we were speaking previously, there is salary guides out there for employers, you know, we it needs it's to be attractive. Yeah. You want people to it's an attractive piece to to for a talent pool to get people into you. So there is a very healthy and attractive salary guide out there for apprentices. Yeah. Um and I think it's think it's a different um like it's a different way of looking at things. You know, when I was eighteen, uh, I went to Minute College, studied Irish, dropped yeah. out, you know, failure. Not really though, to be fair, <laughs> when I look at myself now. But that was kind of the only pathway we had. Yeah, yeah. You know, there wasn't no none of these apprenticeships that I knew of. Um, and when I look back, I could have made serious book yeah, yeah. over two or three years, getting that salary and then getting an education at the same yeah. time. It can probably relieve like a lot of the financial burden that comes with going to college full time, like after 100%. the leaving certs. Absolutely hundred percent. And the great thing about apprentices is they pay nothing. There's no fees. They don't pay anything. The employer will pay uh, a registration fee, but then the employer to be able to uh, hire an apprentice um, has to be solace registered. And I, I want to make a differentiation just right now. There's craft apprenticeships um, and then That'd there's non-craft. Yeah, so there so is different sort of legislation around w how they are ran. So I'm speaking on behalf of the non-craft. Um, yeah. So non-craft started in 2016. So prior to non-craft, uh, there was I think 24 apprentices in Ireland. Apprenticeship programs. Yeah, now there's a lot more. Now there's about 77. Yeah. So the, the scope of everything has changed. Um, but the, for 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 ourselves, the need the employer needs to be Solus registered. Once they get Solus registered, so that they can hire an apprentice, they're entitled to a two thousand euro grant. Okay. The fee is six hundred or eight hundred euro. So they're actually the employer's making money, and there's no there's no hidden fee, there's no hidden charges for yeah. the students. So you're going to college for free, basically. You're getting an education, you're upskilling, you're developing, and then you're actually working full time as well so in the same breath, well. and you're getting your salary. Yeah, which is not bad. And some some of the salaries that we spoke about, like they're they're decent enough for like apprenticeship programs, right? They're like quite attractive, yeah. So know? like, say for the higher certificate, you'd say for a salary guide, you're looking at anywhere between because it's entry level, if you wish, yeah. 25, 24 and a half, 25 up to maybe twenty eight. And then if you were in the the higher diploma, you'd be looking possibly between twenty eight plus up to up to the early thirties, yeah. which is a very good salary, but. The, the inflation, the cost of everything has gone up and I think employers have to match that as well because the expectation for people is, c can I can I survive? Yeah. Rent yeah, or even living at home trying to save or, or just even trying money. to live their own life. Yeah. You know, you don't want to be living on the breadline whereas the apprenticeship model gives that opportunity for people to earn while they learn, um, get an education and then I think the value of being in an office or being in a work environment and learning from your peers as well is, is, is magical. Yeah, 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 definitely. And is it the same situation, right? So level six, the, the guys, they apply online mm -hmm. through NCI's website for the level six, but with the level eight then in data analytics, yeah. are, is that then employer, you, you know, you have a job in an employer mm -hmm. and then that's how you employ, or does the college then, you know, help you find a job? If it's The financial services is the exact same process. So if you're okay. looking for the level six higher cert or level eight higher diploma, go to NCI website, National College of Ireland, study, then apprenticeships and then apply them. Okay. I'll manage that. That's my job. Is I manage in your application. Yeah. Employers then, well, when when the registration stops, we'll release all that information to the employers. Yeah. It is out of our hand at that stage, unfortunately. But we've set up a kind of a supplementary form to give um the apprentices in like, in no more than two hundred and fifty words. Tell me why you, you would be a job. perfect employee. Okay. Employee. Tell me why you'd be an apprentice. So it gives that. Uh, autonomy back to the apprentices to kind of stick their neck out you know oh, I've done this I've done that I've, I have this cert I have that cert so the employer will then go and, and hire with the recruitment apprenticeship it's a little bit different yeah. Um, sorry yeah just on the finance one it once you the NCI then sends your once the NCI has your application yeah. right and sends it out to employers you still have to interview with the employer right yes and so the, it's up to the employer then if they hire you to fund the yes. apprenticeship yes okay. so you know, we're the education provider. Um, my recruitment brain in the back of me wants to get everyone a job and I see all these candidates and I'm going crazy. But unfortunately, yeah. we don't have any say in that, you know. Okay. Um, but as I said, with COVID, we've been able to kind of get this nationwide. So there are clients now that have offices in difference Offaly, Leitrim, Limerick, and I, can, I, I, and I can see people coming through from those different uh, counties. Yeah. So w what we have is we've, we've tailored the application or the administration for, for the client that they can then filter, say if they have a, a, an office in Cork, they'll click who's in Cork 
and they'll see candidates in Cork. Right. So it's a little bit easier for the for the for the candidate to get employed that way. Yeah. Um. But yes, yeah, nationwide, okay. uh, how the employer goes about interviewing or rounds of interviews or you know uh, contract is, is is that's up to them. That's up to them. Unfortunately. Okay. And is there a headcount on how many apprentices or apprentices can go through the course every year? We, I think we have a max on each programme between 50 and 60. Now okay. I have, uh, between two, as I said, we have 100, which could be split 60, 40, 50, 50, 70, 30. Yeah. Um, but the role that I'm in now is to kind of, you know, amplify uh, the, the the apprenticeships with, with NCI, get more clients on, like there's, there's no short, and there's a, a war on talent or a skill shortage, which I don't agree there is. I just think there's a lot of people out there that are looking to get employed, but the employers just need, we need more employers. Yeah. There's not enough clients. You know, there's so many there's so many industries and businesses out there in the financial services sector that aren't engaged with us. And I can tell you, if we could even get four or five more clients, we could possibly get everyone a spot. Yeah. Okay. But there's no shortage on people looking for work. Yeah. But there's a shortage on clients hiring people. Okay. Yeah, which is fair enough. But it's kind of funny at the moment. Yeah. I think the, every, there's a lot of uncertainty out there like, mm. in terms of hiring. Um, Grant, and is the courses then they're run from September through the academic year, or yes. is there two start dates? Through um, the year? What we're doing now is we're hoping to have every like everyone start in September, um, without going okay. through too many things. Which uh, we're going through a revalidation process at that moment, which means we have our course that runs for five years. Yeah. Then we have to go back to the QQI, which is a government body that gives us the award level six, level eight. We have to present back to them why why the course should be running, you know, go through all the documents, the modules, the lectures, all that. So we're going through that at the moment. All going well, they'll all start in September. Okay. If there is an issue, there might be a January start. Right. But with That's that, right. it'll be the academic year. Um, the higher certificate runs on two semesters for two years. The higher diploma runs on three semesters for two years. Ish. So because it's a little bit more detailed, they'll do a September to December, a January to May, and a June to September. So there'll be a consistent okay. kind of uh, academic flow there but generally we try and keep it to the academic year like any other college Grant. and just anyone that then does apply right are they doing six months on site with the employer before they go to college like as a probation period before like you know the contract's fully initiated or we would, does that depend on the employer it depends on the employer we have given uh, insights to employers to say look i'm, I'm going to be releasing the details of, of the candidates at the moment that we have in april with the candidate booklet for them to go and have a look and see what the, our talent pool is like I've asked the employers if they could get them in as quick as they could. Yeah. Because you know yourself, onboarding, HR, you know, you have to go through a couple of trainings when you first start. It takes yeah. possibly maybe three to four or five months just to find your fee. What's my role? Who do I work for? What's my day-to-day -day looking like? Yeah. What's my weekly schedule like? How can I make an impact? So we, we were asking the employers to give the candidates enough time to settle because yeah. I think if they were to hire an apprentice in September and then they start in September, it's a lot. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I suppose if you took them on for that six months probationary period, mm. right? That's all almost like your phase one of mm -hmm. a trade or craft apprenticeship. Yeah, um, which would make sense, right? Yeah, even three to, three months is probably yeah. plenty. But yeah, I'd yeah. Without six, getting into the phases, because I know there's there's, there's, there's different ones, there's yeah. different ones. But with, with that, just just like anybody else, with a probation period for three months when you hire them on, like. Are they the right fit? Do, like, uh, do they yeah. match our, our mission statements and our values, you know, and have we done the right thing here? Um, and I think people do need that couple of months just to find their feet as well and just to settle into the job. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Some, as I said, with the level six, uh, higher certificate, these are school leavers who probably yeah, have job, never yeah. had a job before. So they're, and especially now with the world of, of work, be it hybrid, be it online, be it on MS Teams and watching calendars. You know, it's 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 tough for someone to go straight into a job, and then it's even more tough to, for them to go straight into a job and then go straight into college. Yeah, because the learning starts from day one. Your assignments are due in six weeks. <laughs> it's you know no I mean? messing around. There's there, no yeah. messing. Like yeah. it is. It's a feat, and I have to say, I'm so proud of everyone that's gone through it, especially my my cohort and the previous. Yeah. That they're working full time, and they're doing full time college. Yeah, it's I know it's right. one day, but it's condensed in a way that like they've got so many assignments, and it's from from day one. Yeah, you're in and you're in so as much uh, i would hope the employers would give them as much time but unfortunately again yeah. i have to take my recruiter brain away because yeah. i'm not on the recruitment side of it but uh yeah hopefully to give them enough time to settle in yeah as an employer i'd be dubious about kind of taking someone on in let's say august and putting them into an apprenticeship program mm. straight away like um i just don't like culture fit everything else like you know do they actually want to be a recruiter mm -hmm. you know 
where am I going at with this person? Are they really motivated? Are they just looking for a degree and going to move on? Mm-hmm. So I'd want to make sure I was making the right investment on the person. Yeah. So I think like that six months is crucial. Or three months even, I'd be happy. But then, with. especially in the financial services, you're, we're dealing with multinational corporations. And most of the HR and the onboarding and the hiring happens outside of Ireland. So we were dealing with one company. Yeah. And I think they're from England. Um, and it's it, like I have to try and fit in with their talent strategy for the year. So like obviously their quarters, let's say quarter one we're in oh, now, okay. quarter two, quarter three. Head counts on budgets. Yes. Okay, yeah. So we're trying to we're trying to find that that marriage between, you know, the multinationals that like we're tr- get, I, I'm saying get them in May. And they're like, Well no, we're not hiring until August. I'm like, yeah, but they're going to college and they're like, Yeah, but we're not hiring until August. So we'll see how it goes. We'll see. We're re- building relationships as we speak and you know, so, hopefully we can get them in as quick as we can because from my brain, like your brain, yeah, is easy, but when it gets to multinationals and the HR and the, the onboarding and the talent strategy, it's, it can be different from company to company. Yeah, yeah. I'm quite quick. Like, if, yeah. if you do the interview, you do well, okay, let's get this moving, let's get you 100%. in. But the beer company, yeah, it can be yes. long winded. Yeah. That's, recru- that's a recruiter, though, you know what I mean? Get them in and get them out. Well, yeah. uh, temporary wise, hire quick. I'd be doing 40 interviews a day one day and then I'd need them out by Friday. Yeah. So we'd have to get them out. <laughs> so, because as, like, the shelf life of a candidate in recruitment is not long. Yeah, I think uh, it depends on the job, right? Yes. Uh, and depends on how senior the job is. But mm. yeah, you're looking at a. 24 hour to 40 hour turnaround on the temp desk uh, yes because desk. they're looking for a job and they want it yesterday yeah they need like people need to pay their bills as well right yeah. so you can understand it uh, grant okay so the recruitment apprenticeship mm. then it's complete it's a bit different how it's run you have to slightly. gain employment before you can be sent on the apprenticeship program right it's slightly different so we partner with um their employment recruitment federation that spearheaded the first ever uh, degree in the world level a for for recruitment executives so um okay. the, we, we partner with the your uh, employment recruitment federation um in the kind of recruitment and uh, retention talent there um you can again on the website go to national college of ireland study apprenticeships you'll see the financial services and then you'll see the recruitment executive Whereas when it says contact us and the financial services, I'm there. You'll see a lady called Janice O'Rourke. She's a f- fantastic lady. Okay. You can send your CV to her. Okay. And she'll, f- like we have, uh, like, you know, a consortium steering group of, of recruitment agencies. And what Janice will do, she'll go out and she'll say, look, I like what I'm doing, but just on her side. Oh, and side she'll say, look, I have these CVs. But then we also try and um, promote in-house, uh, you know, uh, progression. So if there was, say, if you had a, your company and you had a couple of staff, and you had someone there that wanted to upskill or, 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 or develop themselves, you can put them forward as well. Okay. So it's not just like, if you found yourself that you just had got a job in a recruitment agency and you're only hearing about the recruitment executive now, you could go to your employer, your boss, and say, look, hey, John, uh, I've seen this. Is there any chance that we could maybe collaborate? Um, so you could do that, but you don't need to go and find an employer first. You send your CV to Janice O'Rourke okay. through the NCI website or go onto the Employment Recruitment Federation website. Yeah and contact them and just say, look, I'm looking, I'm trying to get work. I'm looking for the, the recruitment executive uh, degree apprenticeship and Janice will help you out there. Right. So it doesn't mean you, you don't have to go and find an employer, but if you are in employment, you can also come through that way as well. Way. Yeah. Okay, Grant, so there's two avenues there. Yes. Okay, Grant. And your background, right? So obviously you're in hospitality before you moved yes. into recruitment. Why did you even decide to be a recruiter? Well, do you always say you fell into it, don't they? Yeah. yeah. So I was like, I'd lived in Toronto for two years. I'd done a couple of seasons in Spain. I love just, I like, when I look back on my career and even now, I like, I've been serving people all my life. Be it yeah. serving at a table, serving at a bar, serving in a management firm for my employees, or serving as a recruiter to everybody else and now serving people in my role. And I love serving people. Okay. I love helping people. I love being able to make a difference in someone's life so hospitality was just a natural for me okay people person played to my strengths you know enjoyed the bulls was quite good at what i done and then moved back home to dublin um and was supposed to go on a family holiday to portugal right. i went out on the weekend and i lost my passport <laughs> yeah. so i lost my passport on the saturday night and my family were going flying out on the monday and i was meeting them on the wednesday right. so frantic looking around for a passport couldn't find it couldn't get an emergency one in, in time and I had to say, look, lads, I'm not going. So I was, sit, I was sitting at home, put the fire on, you know, got into me shorts, put on a few Ibiza classics on the telly as well. <laughs> I'm on the way. Yeah. <laughs> had a little drink and said, right, what am I doing? So went and looked for a job and just seeing, as I said, recruitment, hospitality, didn't know what recruitment was. Yeah. Um, looked through the job spec, 
experience, need, and X, Y, and Z. And I said, I can do that. Yeah, yeah. And just applied for the job. Got the interview, got the role. Started off um, sourcing candidates, uh, you know, uh, client calls. <coughs> Excuse me. No, you're fine. Uh, client calls, sourcing candidates, setting up interviews, um, and then the progression started there going into recruitment. Yeah. The recruitment apprenticeship then had only be, was only beginning, um, and I was put forward to go into a pre panel um, just to see what the modules what were sucks. like. Right. Um, and then the opportunity came for the recruitment executive. So I was kind of a great starter because with the recruitment executive apprenticeship, you've got the three years. First year is very, you know, introduction to recruitment, yeah. screening CVs, uh, candidate client calls, career management skills, sales negotiation, ICT skills. Right. So it really kind of set you up in the first year, yeah. probably moving from source and candidates and then to build your own desk. And then you go into second year. And then you get a little bit more specialised in like uh, uh, talent pool strategies, um, employment law. We had okay. an exam on employment law, uh, finance for recruitment. Um, so it's a little bit, you kind of start owning your, your, owning your, trade, yeah. your, your trade. And then in third year, as I said, so I was then growing, starting building my desk, getting my own clients, getting my, my, my candidates out, really enjoying it. Obviously, roller coaster day to day. Yeah. Um, and then in third year, it gets level eight where you have a research project to do, 6,000 words. Um, it, more in-depth if you can't find candidates, how are you going to find them? So they're out there, talent pools. Uh, but over the space of the three years, the, the apprenticeship really kind of sets you up. And it doesn't matter if you're agency, if you're temp, if you're contract, if you're permanent. If you're a TA, if you, we've had public service, we have the defence forces. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. We've ESB, we have agencies, we've permanent, and we've got contractors. Recruitment at the end of the day is recruitment. Yeah, it's finding the right candidate for the right job. It's good for building your network as well. I suppose going network, to and even in force year we have the career management skills, and that is building your brand. Okay. So, like, I'm not on actually, I'm not on any socials other than LinkedIn. And over the last three years, I've built a brand on LinkedIn, just giving content out, giving a couple of data, going to networking events. I was at a LinkedIn event there last week. Uh, I've got an event on Thursday. I've got an event on Friday. So just going and meeting people and talking. I like what we're doing now, just talking yeah, to people. Like, away, the yeah. recruitment industry is huge. It's so diverse. But at the end of the day, everyone's a recruiter. Mm. No matter if you're an MD or if you're a sourcer, you're yeah. doing the same thing. It's yeah, it's the same thing. It's 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 repetitive in a sense, but it's it's different. It's, yeah. The conversations are different, and a conversation can take you down different rabbit holes all yes. the time, right? So it's, I, think, I, I think I find it really interesting. I love job, it, but it's. Uh, but I think, but with the repetitive thing as well, I think at the very start, it need, you need to be repetitive because you need yeah. to be doing the same thing day in day out because it teaches you how to, you know, say like you, on a Monday have your interviews booked on a Monday. Yeah. Have your candidate specked out and gone out to your client by Wednesday. So if you have that sort of that routine and that sort of um, that flow, your desk will then come with you. Yeah, I think like when I take people in to train them or whatever, like I just tell them like high performance is just full execution of the basics, right? Yes. So it's like making the day plan and mm. doing what you say you're gonna do, mm. um, and then splitting your day into three, like what like find our keeper door. Yes. And um, from Ryan Sherhan, but yeah. um, that's how I, that's how I'd train someone. But uh, taking you back then, yes. right? So what was the interview process for you? Like when you got to an agency, mm -hmm. when you started recruitment, like what was it like? Was it one round, two rounds? Three it, rounds? it was one round. So I, I worked with a, a company called Broadline Group under okay. the fantastic leadership of Suzanne Gare and, and then my associate director was Loretta Garrity. And it was just one interview. Yeah. Um, it was an interview with, it was an interview with the MD, who's Suzanne. Um, I'm looking back now, you know, from being kind of taught how to interview and skills and things to watch out for, you know, the handshake, well, prior COVID, the handshake and yeah. uh, talking to the receptionist, do you want a glass of course allowed? Because then the receptionist is going to go and say, he's nice, he's lovely. You know, little kind of tips and tricks. Yeah. Um, but when I was in with Suzanne, we just had a lovely conversation, went through my CV and they're very much skills-based hiring. Yeah. You know, so they see my skills there. I was in hospitality That's for 12 years. Yeah. I'd managed my own team at a time. Um, and they seen traits and characteristics that kind of brought me into the recruitment world, which I had recognised already. Yeah. And then she left the room. Then she came back with the associate directors. Okay. I didn't know what was going on. She had two rounds of one interview. Okay. So I didn't know what was going on. Yeah. And then when I looked back and like when I was actually in the company and, you know, somebody was in and the MD would come in and talk and then she'd come back down to the sales room and say, 
you know, Loretta, Barbara, come up and meet John or something. I'm like, oh, he must be good. Right. So yeah, it, it wasn't that, like, and because we were so in SME, you know, it's a small, small to medium enterprise. And just if they're listening, a huge congratulations. They won a uh, toward best workplace SME effort, great place to work last week. Yeah, lovely culture, lovely people. Um, but I didn't realize that I was having two interviews in one okay. um, until I started learning the craft and seeing how it works. But again, just general chit chat. Yeah. Um, it's also good to do that with people though, because yeah. well, you kind of gauge their reactions um, yeah. and it kind of breaks the unpreparedness because you can be very over, or I suppose, over prepared for an interview. 100%. And they can kind of catch you on the hop then to see how you react and like, that's how you'll probably react on the job. You know? People say to me that I have interview problems or something, I'd say just know your CV because yeah. all you're doing is you're just going to speak about yourself yeah, well, and your right. experience. Now, have your little anchors, like have, if you've worked on projects, if you've managed X amount of teams, if you've, you know, X, Y, and have your little anchors that you can steer the interview, but this interview is basically about yourself and your CV. Yeah. If there's gaps in your CV and you don't know where you've been, they're going to find out where you've been. They're going to yeah. ask where your gaps are. It's a big thing catching people right with not having the month and the year they yeah. start and finish the jobs. Like, and it's like, well, where were you? There's a yes. four month gap here. Where were you? And even just down to the interview process in, in the sense of like, you've put your CV forward for this job. Have you tailored your, your, your profile to it? You know, you, you might have down, oh, I've done this, but you haven't highlighted if you're going for a recruitment job or if you're going for a job in construction. Make that the highlight, you know, and I think when it comes across and you can see the, the superstars versus the ones that are only just click and bait, click, apply, click, apply, yeah. click, apply. Using the job board like a Tinder. <laughs> yeah, 100%. <laughs> literally. But, um, yeah, look, I think with the apprenticeship, though, more importantly, right, I mm. think, like, uh, the CV is important, right, but yes. if you're just out of school or you're a school leaver, your CV is not going to be that comprehensive. Uh -huh. So I think what's going to have to happen is that you're going to have to have a really good cover letter mm -hmm. that highlights your interest in the industry that you're applying yes. to. And it needs to be tailored specifically for every apprenticeship that you're going for. Mm -hmm. So be it a recruitment yeah. um, job or a plumber or whatever it is, yeah. right? you need to make sure it's tailored. Like experience is is fantastic, okay? Yeah, but I think people are hiring people these days. Yeah. Do you know, I think it's skills. I know it's skills force hiring, but people are hiring people and they're hiring people on how they show up. And they're hiring people on, say, if you go to the interview and you're early or you're dressed well or you just, you come across nice. But I'd go to, which, and I'm loving my job now, and I'm, which I, I've, I've got, which I've loved every job that I've yeah. had, but I'm really kind of finding my own now. And I'm going out to secondary schools, which okay. I've never done, which I love. Yeah. Talking to fourth years, fifth years, sixth years. They don't work. And I, I've tried to think of how, like, how can I help these guys that haven't worked? Get out and volunteer. Yeah. You know, little things or, you know, do it, do something for charity. Like if you have no experience on your CV, you can still show your personality through your CV. Yeah, 100%. A big thing I think, right, I think everyone says, oh, you know, you should do two years in the army. Everyone should have to do it. I disagree with that, right? Did but you do two years in the army? I've done 10. Oh, did you? <laughs> yeah. But what I would say is, um, I think everyone should get a job in hospitality before yes. they do anything. Because uh, I think it teaches you, I suppose, I suppose you make money. Yeah. It teaches you what it's like to serve someone and mm. to give good customer service. Mm. And then, you know, you know how hard that job is when you're also sitting yeah. in a restaurant then as well, because mm. everyone goes out to eat at the end Hospitality of the day. And like, I, I have to say, like, I've had, I can count, I can remember all of the lovely guests and I can remember all of the bad guests. Yeah. Right? And especially as you, as you work up through management, you know, you're just there to serve them. And there's some people that just are not having a good day. And I think perspective is huge in life. Like, yeah. you know, you might, somebody might be coming into you in hospitality and they might not be having a good day and they'll take it out on you. Yeah. Not great to get it, but... Take your, take the emotion out of it and just, you know, just look after them. And that's all they're there for. Just look after them. And especially in recruitment as well, it is such a, a roller coaster. But it's, it, it can be quite emotional. You know, you, you have some fella ready, he's a superstar, he's gone for the job, and then he doesn't turn up. Or, yeah, the, or the client tells you, this is what we're looking for, these are the main things, the, de the de desirables and expectations, and then they go for somebody else. And it can be quite disheartening, but then there, there are so many more good days that, that overshadow the bad days as well. So I think the, having a perspective, and I think as well, we need to be mindful of the newer generation coming in that might not have that perspective that are a little bit kind of closed off. They might not have that life experience. And um, so we need to be mindful coming into the next generation, generational wave of the workforce to ensure that we're, we're being mindful in the office or we're being mindful how we train. Yeah, yeah, because sometimes I suppose the world isn't always as it seems in, mm. on paper, you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's a different place. Or through the lens of Instagram or through the lens of TikTok. Yeah. And this is where these kids are too. saying things, you know, do you see people out in, I don't know, these lovely places, but yeah, how did they get there? Probably through finance. We're not telling you that. 
you yeah. know what I mean? Well, that's so it, it's you know? perspective. But with the apprenticeship in Torge here, we have to do a research project. So we have a, a module called Contemporary Issues in the recruitment industry. And like that, I kind of, I was going through different things like what they do, what uh, L&D, because I was really focused on L&D. I wanted to do L&D. I didn't know what L&D meant really, but I just learned and development. I wanted to get into that space. Okay. Then I I honed down and my research topic was on uh, Generation Z and the future of the workforce, which blew me away. So at the moment... Some research gone on there. Oh, it was amazing, <laughs> right? And, uh, and it seems daunting, but it's not because... And I'll, I don't think I mentioned, with, with the apprenticeships, the way that you're set up is uh, to be registered as an apprentice employer, you have to have a mentor yeah, okay. on site. So a mentor needs to be someone that has experience between three and five years, maybe in a senior team lead role or a senior role. And that mentor will then be assigned to you like a buddy system. Yeah. So especially for the school leavers or people that are starting out in the industry, you have someone that you can trust, that you can go and like soundboard off ideas. This is my re- this is my 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 assignments. I remember my old my, my ex employer, uh, Loretta, she was my uh, mentor and she said to me in first year, which I love, she was like, If you the way my mind worked, if I had an assignment, I say if it was if I was going to Galway, she goes, you go down through Waterford, Wexford, Cork, swing up to Donegal, go back to. She's like, just like I just yeah. I had so I couldn't configure my brain just to do what I had to do. Okay. But then by third year, I didn't need that support as much because I'd grown through yeah. that through that. And then in college, we also have an academic supervisor who you're assigned to. So you're assigned to a mentor in your workplace, which are there four days. And then when you're in the one day college, you have an academic supervisor. So you've got two soundboards. You've got someone on the job learning that you're speaking to, that's your mentor, and then you have an academic supervisor that's um, experienced in mentorship within academia. Okay. So you're you're kind of you're kind of covered from both ends. So, but when I was taking on the research project, I you know it was it was tough enough. But when I look back, it wasn't that tough because my brain just goes everywhere. Yeah. I got together a focus group of people in Gen Z. Um, I done a survey analysis. I sent out questions, um, and I found out so. At the moment where we are in employment, there's four generations in 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 employment. In employment at the moment, baby boomers, Gen Y, Gen Gen, baby boomers, Gen Y, I think millennials, and then Gen Z. So when you look at like say AI, if you want, or te- even just technology, yeah, you look at say one company, they might have someone in their sixties, in their fifties, forties, thirties, twenties, and not everybody takes the technology as say myself, yourself, or the Gen Zs, so. It's trying to navigate and trying to manage all generations to the one goal. Um, but then there's also like a perspective of the Gen Z is coming into the workforce, that they're lazy, that they don't value this and their motivation to work. They just want to sit at home and do nothing. Whereas my research, when I went out and spoke to the Gen Zs was, and it's interesting because, you know, they're the first generation that have been through two, two recessions. Um, their family are working, mum and dad are working. If you think about probably my mum's generation, my dad's generation, their mum and dad weren't working, mum was at home. You know, so the gener- as the generations go, everyone's working. But, well, they're not, they weren't working, but nowadays the working family is, there's, no one's at home. Yeah. You're at home, if you're coming home from school for your lunch, you're making your own lunch. There's no one there. Yeah, Do you know what I mean? Or mum and dad would be home at five or six, or dad and dad, or mum and mum be home at five or six. So they're they're unique in their perspective that they're they're, they're the first digital age as well. They were born into digital. Okay. Yeah. I didn't have Facebook or Bebo or MySpace. I had MySpace when I was 14. Um, or Aircom Chat. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> Back in the MSN. You saw your age though. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I know. Um, but like we were on, we were introduced to technology, whereas yeah. they were born into technology. Right. And I think there's a huge misconception of what they want. So then my findings found out that, you know, they value progression. They want autonomy, they want to be able to kind of grow and, and develop, but they also need support and guidance because that's the generation that they are. They, they're, they're being told that they know too much, but every generation's told that. Yeah. So it was, it, was, it was good to see that their motivations was, they, yeah, they want a good salary because of uh, how hard it is to live these days and to, to, to survive, but they also valued and were motivated by, well, are you going to help me on my journey? Is okay. there support there for me? And like they want to be looked after, yet they want to be left alone. But it's just but then I then looked at organisations. So by twenty twenty seven, seventy five percent. What are we now? Twenty four in three years. Seventy five percent of the workforce will be millennials and Gen Z. Right. So what's that? Nineteen eighty four onwards, and the rest are being pushed out. Our organisation set up for this seventy five percent workforce. 
I don't know. They say they are, but most of them aren't. Do you know, do they have training and progression plans in place? Do they have well-being and mental support in place? Do they have uh, online uh, training for if they're going to be online or if their personal brand's online or if they get attacked online? Like, just, We're in such a new digital world. But I was interested to see, because it's going to be such an intake by 2027, our organisation's ready for it. And I just gave a couple of recommendations. And that all came through an apprenticeship. Yeah, it was brilliant. While I was working full-time. Did you have an academic background before you got into recruitment? No. No, this was your first kind of I went qualification. To, I went to college when I was 18. I went to Minute, studied Irish and Celtic studies, and I dropped out. Okay, after a year, was it? Uh, I repeated second year, and okay. the, the grammar, Irish grammar, was just too hard. Um, so I dropped out, so now, leaving cert. Okay, you stayed in hospitality. I'm leaving cert. Yeah. I'm, a, I'm a college school dropout, leaving cert, 365 points, um, and but I learned from life. Yeah. I went into hospitality. Learned the best best insights into what you how to uh, how to manage and, and get the best out of people, and how to manage and manage the worst in people. <laughs> uh, and then I travelled, okay. and I'd seen new cultures. I was exposed to new people and new ideas. And then I came back and all encompassed. Now I went back as a mature student. Yeah, brilliant. It's good that you got the opportunity to do that. Hundred oh, percent. I'm so grateful. Yeah. How long were you? How long were you working in the agency? before they sent you on the apprenticeship program i started in i started in july because that's when my family went on holidays and i didn't right. i lost my passport so i started in july 2019 yeah. and started the course september 2020. Okay, so i was yeah. fresh in yeah yeah and like that that's what i'm saying like i'm saying you have to have employment you can apply online for the apprenticeship programs but also if you have somebody in, in your team that's there a year two or three or four whichever but that you think that would benefit from it you can put them forward as well yeah it's kind of it's a different way of applying because normally if you get like a craft apprenticeship back in the day it's like either your dad or your uncle or your cousin mm. you know somebody it's like it's kind of like not what you know it's who you know yeah whereas that kind of changed a little bit right yeah um, going through the college but you still have to get yourself through the interview right and that's where yeah. the soft skills comes in Soft skills are huge. Communication skills. You can learn hard skills. You can learn hard skills. It's a little bit more difficult to learn soft skills. Yeah, I'd rather like hire attitude and train the skills. Um, I think everyone's on that opinion. Somebody right? like if opinion. they want to show up and do what like, and especially that's why why when I say to say people that don't have a job or are are in a job six or seven months and they jump and jump, just you know, just keep trying. Because I think if you if you just kind of have a defeatist attitude and you just, you know, it's not for me or especially with leaving to your students that are coming out with no, volunteer for a day. Like go and try and do something or if you see scouts or order a malt or those little things, yeah. tell me your get up and do her. Yeah. And that's what I'd hire you for. The Goshka Awards actually goes for that yes. as well, yeah. Um, yes. The president, it's called the presidential. Yes, Goshka. yeah. The bronze level, I think you've yeah. when you're a bit younger. Just um, little things, you know. But I think that differentiates yourself from the, from the rest. You know, if you have just someone that's left school that hasn't, he has nothing on the CV but about me. You know, I I go to the gym five days a week and I play Fortnite on the weekend. Great, but yeah. that doesn't tell me on when then I see someone that's in Order Malta or they volunteered for the local charity for a day or two, packing bags and duns. I'd rather take that. Yeah, it just shows commitment. That's yeah. what you're looking for. You're looking for a commitment. You know, yeah, so it just depends on the individual. I yeah. always look for like someone maybe played a team sport. Mm. Um, it's pretty good. Or, but then again, you wouldn't want to put anybody else in a disadvantage either that maybe, you know, doesn't have the social skills or doesn't have the confidence to go out and do those things. But I think also being honest with yourself and with your employer and saying, look, I just love this space. Oh, you know, I read all these books about it. anything to show that you've interest. Um, and then to be honest as well with the employer that you're just looking for a chance. And I think people are looking for, people are hiring people these days. They're not, yeah, they're not hiring roles. Does, does other like online resources, um, the likes of LinkedIn Learning, right, mm. is pretty good. You get a 30-day free trial on that. Mm. Udemy. Um, yeah. So if you want to be an accountant, do a Udemy course. Mm. Uh, basics of accountants here. Have Basic you heard of social talent? talent? Social talent, yeah. That's really really good. Johnny Campbell, amazing platform. Yeah, so does other platforms yeah. out there that could, you could put you could do the course put it on the cv and 100%. that might help you as well so little things just little yeah. things just showing show interest that's it's basically yeah the, that's the how feedback. you differentiate people yeah. people that want to do something and people that just want to be given something yeah and and what yourself then like where you how are you getting to work where you're driving where you uh, at the moment bus? or previous oh God, previously oh yeah, during the during the i suppose the recruitment phase yeah. like how are you getting to work beyond the bus so or i was i live in blanchestown i was getting up a quarter to six i had to be in the office for eight o'clock and i walked out on tally so i was getting up every day monday friday getting up a quarter to six getting on the bus at half six 
jumping off on uh, Parliament Street, getting the bus from Dame Street and getting the 27 out to Tala. Okay. So I left the house at half six and got home at seven. Yeah. Do you drive or do you have a car? Have a car there. Uh, moved out of uh, the house and just rented for a while. Um, but have a car there and now starting to, with especially with the new job, you know, I'm, I can work from home. Yeah. Um, and it gives me more freedom and autonomy to kind of get these things yeah, done. Yeah, yeah. So looking looking to get into the driving, um, but okay. trying to trying to push myself that way. I've kind of had I'd push. I was so much focused on work and in college. Like yeah. my weekends were gone in towards year. I was studying. I was reading. I was trying to watch things online, and you just don't have time. Um, mm. But now I've a bit more. I've gotten through with that now. Yeah, I'm kind of plateauing at the moment, so I'm just. Enjoying myself now. Yeah. Well, that's and true. focusing on, on me and how I can personally develop develop myself. Yeah. Yeah. And did you, were you driving or did you have your driving license when you were in the agency? Uh, no, I didn't have the driver's license. I bought the car just as I was leaving the agency. Um, right. And then I moved out for a year because I uh, just wanted to kind of just live on by myself. Yeah. And, you know, it's tough for my dad and my family as well when you're at home and you have your, your laptop and your desk. And it just, the setup wasn't right. Um, yeah. So I moved out for a year, but then realised I was paying someone's mortgage. Yeah. Unless I can't do that. Not so, yeah, so I moved back home after a year and now just kind of tipping away, getting the savings up um, and then trying to get out on the road now. It's like many Irish people. Yeah, it's tough. Too. It's not easy. Do you do you find, or did you find, not driving or not having a car made your life a little bit harder or difficult to get yeah. to get to work? Um, yes, as I said, two buses, yeah. four buses a day. Big commitment. Whereas I could have just went over the M50 in 20 minutes. Yeah. Um. Yeah, hundred percent. Like, come here. Driving is a thing, but like, especially now at my age, I think you're a little bit more fearful of the road. I think one of my friends said once, "I'm not afraid of my driving. I'm afraid of somebody else's." Yeah, well, they're confident in themselves driving, but just whoever else out, is out on the road. So I think it's a little bit more difficult in that sense. And then it's just money, yeah. especially when you get over to an age bracket with insurance. You're kind of put into that kind of debt toll. Yeah, so yeah. insurance is a lot of money. Um. But yeah, if I did have a car, a lot easier. I would have been able to go to a lot more events. I'd be able to go out to, to the west a lot more for work, um, and I didn't. Ha- I wouldn't have to wake up at quarter to six. Okay. <laughs> you know, so if there's anyone out there that wants to get driving, get driving. Yeah, well, <laughs> make sure it's hybrid though as well. You know? <laughs> just for, just it, for our PC. Uh, yeah, keep it PC. Well, um, well, yeah, even if you don't have a car or you don't have insurance, I'd always recommend getting your driving license because what can actually happen is your employer might give you the car mm, or yeah. like it actually holds a lot of people back. Yeah. Not being able or not being willing to yes. take two buses to work. Yeah, 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 um, yeah. Like most apprentices that we've interviewed now have had to get two or three buses to wow. work every day. And I find in my job, right, yeah. guys that are in the, the lower paid jobs, right, mm-hmm. not that there's anything wrong with it, right, because mm. there's not. And it's important that everyone works and contributes, right. Mm. But they miss out on opportunities by not having the driving license yeah. um, or not being willing to travel to different locations. So, it's Do you find that, say, say, now with some junior apprentices, do you find that they, they're kind of, they're at a disadvantage because is it because of that they're only starting the apprenticeship and they're kind of left with all the, like I do see some of the craft, I'm not saying they're apprentices, but I do see them on the bus and they're carrying all the tools. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I know everyone has to start somewhere. But again, as you said, if you had a car, you'd be better off with all that. Yeah, yeah. Like it's it's heartbreaking having to lug your uh, all your tools into yes. town, wait for another yeah. wait for another bus, hope your tools don't get robbed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. then take the other bus down to site. Like so yeah, it's tough. Like yeah. and I think like I don't know if you if an if an employer would give you a van as an mm. apprentice, I think they'd be happy to see a struggle show, right? Because it shows the commitment. I know, but, but, but I think that year too. Work scheme. Yeah, bike to work scheme, yeah, even a bike. Yeah. Uh, might help. Tools on a bike as well, you're heavy, unless you have a basket. Yeah, that's a different story. Oh, but then car sharing as well. Yeah, you know, I talk to lads on site or talk to ladies on site um, and, and see who's where. I've, I've seen that a couple of times, the, the van sharing, which is good as well. Then that kind of builds relationships. But um, I think, I think especially now, and with the way, like I put a LinkedIn post about apprentices because I was, I was trying to understand what's the perception. And like, so I think we all have a perception. Yeah. You know, apprentice, craft, man, tools, construction. You know, it's and changing. it's it's so the landscape is so different. So I put up on LinkedIn as like, what's the what, what what's the barrier to, for people not taking an apprentice? And the biggest one was myths, um, or perceptions. So I'm I'm on this kind of case finding mission of like, what are these myths? But what is great to see is the intake of female apprentices in the craft apprentices is on is on the up. Post twenty twenty post twenty sixteen non craft apprentices women are leading that as well, yeah. um, and I think. 
just even by myself here or anybody else, like we have a great community with the National Apprentices Apprenticeship Office. We're partners in that. We go to meetings. We talk about how we can uh, we, how we can help out and, and shed the light on apprentices. Um, you know, it's it's great to see that there is a perception changing. Um, but then you also wouldn't want somebody not wanting to go into engineering or into construction because they're a because they're a woman yeah. or the army. Do you know what I mean? There's huge a huge intake of ladies in the army, which I think is fantastic because yeah. I think we just have a perception of. You're working in that job and that's all you're going to be doing. Yeah. But there's so much more to it. Uh, on the female side of things, we actually placed, not last year but the year before, we actually placed more women into higher paying jobs than we placed men. And we placed more men overall, but we placed more women into higher paying jobs. Amazing. And then last year, just gone, we only submitted the numbers back um, to the licensed authority. We, the women, men, we made one, it would have been break even except for yeah. we made an extra placement, which was a man. So, I think you're only one off, like, mm. it's just even. It's even, great to even. see, though. And yeah, what, so, what, like, age range, were the young, like, was it, were they placing higher paying jobs because of their experience, uh, or or was it that they were, the, the role was designed for that candidate? I think it was experience. Yeah. I think, and I think, the, well. I think the future is, we're going to see a lot more female graduates mm, mm. Than, uh, than male graduates. But, yeah, that's, I think. So, in my old job, Broadland Group, I think we had, say, what? Well, I can't remember, less than 20 staff, and I think 75% were women. Yeah. And they were powerhouses. P- absolute powerhouses. Women do really well in recruitment. They do really well in recruitment. Really well. Just really well in general, but it's great to see. Like, I know we've got International Women's Day on fr- on Friday. We've got Mother's Day on, on Sunday. Yeah. You know, it's just great to see that the, the landscape is changing. It, I'm hoping it's it's level playing field, and I hope that people watch their back because there's the talent coming out. Like, we are we're flying here in Ireland. Yeah. Oh, it. The economy is like we're a progressive country, right? Yes. But that's just the way it's gone. And uh, back to your apprenticeship yeah. then, right? With certain aunts, if you're doing a craft apprenticeship, right, you'd normally have to do like a shop one for everybody else. Did mm-hmm. you have to do any of that kind of thing in your apprenticeship or during your uh, time at the agency? No, not really. Because I was there, you know, because I was there for a, a period of time prior to it. Yeah. I, or even, know, sure, even like when you started, like where you did uh, like yeah, coffee yeah, uh, yeah, the thing is like, but especially on, on a hospitality temp desk and you have all the events and you have all the, the sporting events coming up. We are, we're out the door. I think I yeah. used to walk into an email inbox of 120 CVs prior, prior, prior to COVID. It was just crazy. But me being the, the guy, you know, well, I make some of the tea or coffee and everyone's hand goes up. You right. know? And then you're stuck, in the, you're stuck in the kitchen and you've got, you're, I actually, what I done was I created a list um, of coffee and tea orders. <laughs> so if I could just write down, you know, four, eight, whoever it was looking at, and I'd go into the kitchen and I'd have the list. No sugar, one sugar, black tea, da, 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 doesn't drink tea, drinks coffee. But, you know, it's it's the office environment. Yeah. Or, you know, uh, the me MD would say to me, Dar, like, here's there's 20 quid, run down and get a few ice creams if it was hot, if it was hot out. But I think it's just the, the and what I think people miss is the, the office environment, which is an environment that you can't replicate online. Now, you can you can replicate parts of it. You still have the, the support. You still have, you know, the camaraderie and... and sending gifts or sending links or whatever but in the office it's different yeah. you feel what's going on if it's a busy morning your head is down you don't yeah. look left or right you don't make the teas or coffees no you, you're too busy yeah you're not going but, for them days <laughs> yeah you, you're going for the smoke you can wait till 11 because we need to get 12 candidates out or we need to get that job up or we need to you need to be calling those clients to check in your staff but i think you do you do miss that office environment but again i think we all have like you know what I'm grateful about being Irish is that we can all have the crack with each other. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Or, you know, sending people off for a glass hammer or something. Do you know, it's just <laughs> little things that I think make us instinctively Irish. Um, uh-huh. Which, and I think as well, like when I lived abroad in, in Canada, the, their humour was very different yeah. to us. So I had to adapt because, you know, very out there and, you know, very brass and... <laughs> <laughs> I not I found out in the first couple of jokes. I was like, okay, we're not, we're not we don't do this over here. Yeah, tone it down a few lot. Tone it down a lot. Yeah. So, but you 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 adapt to different societies as well. But there is huge. Uh, I, I was even coming into the office. I remember one morning, I got in for about half seven, quarter twenty to eight. All the lights off. Walked into the sales room, and my manager jumped out from behind the door. <laughs> I was like, "What? It spilled me coffee everywhere." So, what are you doing? 
bricking herself laughing, turned off all the lights, you know. But then even when your birthday is in, you know, you know there's a cake coming. You can feel it in the yeah. air, the lights go off. Everyone's sneaking around and yeah, sign the yeah, card. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Putting it into like an application form. Yeah. So yeah, the office environment is great. You have to have the crack with each other because you're all in it together. And if you don't have the crack or if you don't find that breaking point of like I remember we were, I think there was this we were having one stress you could just feel it in the air. It was so stressful, something was going on, couldn't tell you what it was, but everybody was just I mean, manager turned around and went, laptops down. Oh, we're taking 10 minutes, everyone went outside. Yeah. You know, so you miss that sort of. You need those days. You need, and, but that's again good management. You can feel that she's stressed out or he's, that client keeps ringing him and he hasn't got the candy. You know, you can feel it. And yeah. sometimes you just need someone just to break the ice, bring it out, get you a coffee, and we'll start afresh. Yeah, so. a bit of friction or. Yeah. I used to do, do a lap around the block. Yeah. Just kind of, yeah. if something bad, around, year, something yeah. bad happened. Yeah. Because um, it does happen. Would you recommend like recruitment as a career? Why not? I think like the average lifespan of an agency recruiter, mm. in my opinion, is around <coughs> 18 months, I think. Mm. Um, yeah. Like, and people tend to do, move on out of the agency. Mm. But would you recommend agency recruitment as a job? I would. I think it's very similar to hospitality. I think the skills learned, uh, you don't really find it in many other industries. I think you're right in regards to lifespan. I think once you're in, you're in. And I think within at least even a year, eight to 12 months, you know if it's for you or if it's not for you. Yeah. I think good managers as well will bring you along on the journey and they will help you um, you know, navigate through the, through the good days and the bad days. You know, like you might have an absolute win, but don't get cocky. Yeah. You know, or you might have an absolute howler of a day. Don't get down. It'll change tomorrow. So I think there's huge uh, emphasis on how we manage and um, bring people along through that journey in recruitment. And I think the apprenticeship is a fantastic way of, of you finding your feet and your voice as a recruiter uh, through, through, through that kind of three years. Um, would I suggest as, a, as an industry, 100%. I think you need to be very realistic with yourself, though, in regards to what a recruiter is. Um, I think in, I can only speak for hospitality, but in just different sectors, construction, IT, finance, uh, there's so many different recruitment elements that like, I can only speak for hospitality, but you know, office support, construction, so you're dealing with quantity surveyors, different sort of different roles, but I think at the end of the day, if you can um, harness your skills and if you can lean into being, and you need to be confident as well because you're a partner at the end of the day, you know, your client's coming to you because you're the recruiter. And they're looking for you to help them, but then you have a candidate as well that's coming to you as a recruiter, and you need to help them. So, it's kind of it's a it's a tricky balance, but I think once you find the balance, it's so rewarding. Yeah. You know, you're like I I had messages from people saying thanks so much. We can go on a holiday now because he got placed, or I can put food on the table. Like it's you're you're really impacting on people's lives, and I think the the recruiter, the life of a recruiter, or, or the or the name of a recruiter doesn't get the the praise it, it does because we help we go hand in hand with the economy. Do you know, like when COVID happened, my desk fell through, like the arse fell off it. Yeah. There was no hospitality. Like there was no clients. There was nothing going on. Yeah, it's a all moved job. to healthcare. So we had to adapt straight away. Got all the hospitality people that were of that could do healthcare, that wanted to do healthcare, that would, would go into hospitals or nursing homes. And that, that business grew. And then we started trickling back into hospitality. So it's a lot of like... It's, being adaptable, yeah. It's so adaptable. It's being resilient. It's being a chameleon. You have to change your colours for different people. You've got clients that like you this way. You've got clients that are this way. You've got candidates that are this way and that way. It, but if you can adapt and, you know, kind of split yourself into a couple of different pieces yeah. uh, and then put yourself back together. Because you came from a hospitality background, right? And then you went into hospitality mm. recruitment. Did you do you feel like you had an advantage? I think so. Um, only because I could speak truth to what was going on in the sense that like, you know, if a client rang me looking for like a VIP event on up in a five star hotel, I knew yeah. the people that we had only recruited, they wouldn't be able for it because it's high, it's fine dining. Yeah. So I, but because I had that experience, I kind of knew who would fit where and I knew how to kind of talk to the clients in a different way. You know, I had fantastic Northside clients. Okay. That I could talk to. How yeah. are you? What's the story? How are you keeping? <laughs> then you had different clients that you'd be, good afternoon. I yeah. hope this email finds you well. Um, you can peruse our, our candidate list, you know, just being adaptable again. But I wouldn't also say to people that have not been in hospitality not to go for it or uh, don't have office administration skills to, go into, to be an office recruiter. I think 
at the end of the day, the spine of a recruiter is the spine of a recruiter. And if you have a good team around you, that they'll bring you along that journey and you'll grow into the role. And as I said again, the apprenticeship is just another avenue for you to upskill, uh, develop and uh, and grow in the industry. Yeah, definitely. I, I'd hire someone that we do, like IT, supply mm. chain procurement, but I, I'd hire anybody with a decent, I suppose, hospitality background yeah. that had an interest in recruitment and not just train them. And and why else. do you? Th- why would you hire them with hospitality? What, what does hospitality mean to you in regards to... It's the customer service aspect yeah. of it and the being of service. Yeah. Um. That's that's why, that's the main reason. And they're also used to work, okay, because mm. it's on your feet, it's hard work. Whereas I know it's different in recruitment, you're on your feet or you're sitting down in recruitment mm. and you're on the desk, but it shows the work ethic as yeah. well. If you know someone's worked in hospitality, they haven't, they weren't sitting around like hiding in, hiding yeah. in the press, you know, yeah. bluffing the work. Like there's mm. nowhere to hide, I don't think, in a restaurant yeah, um, or in a hotel. I don't, well, it depends on your job, right? You could, yeah, you could but, uh, out the back of the kitchen. Yeah, but yeah you probably could, yeah. You'd be caught out Every by yourself. Again, but you'd be, you know, oh, I remember when I worked in a restaurant as well, like it was no hiding, like the manager is on you, like yeah. they need all hands on deck. So mm-hmm. that's why I like the hospitality side of it. Yeah. And that's why I think everyone should, you know, work in some form of uh, hospitality yeah but yeah that's and i think i think it gives you um i think as a hospitality worker you're an entrepreneur because now i'm not too sure how to do it these days but back in my day you had sections and i wanted to make money so when i had my section i had my four tables my six tables my eight tables and what i walked out with at the end of the night was down to me yeah, did, I, did, I, did i manage my orders right if i had four tables i sat up once did i put them all in together or did i space them out do you know did i romance or talk about the the menu item and ups and and up up, up upsell the a nice bottle of wine and those innate skills really really kind of set you up for life yeah as a way all right were you, were you on commission on what you sold or what your your uh, bills are or canada yeah okay yeah. ireland no okay yeah. so in canada i would say if i had sections i was given I I'd got a percentage of my tips, so I think, or I had to get, I had to pay back a percentage of my tips. So say if I made a hundred quid, I'd have to give 18 percent back to the house, so that'd be eighteen euro, and I'd keep the rest. Okay. But then it's, if you got if you got better at it, you could get bigger sections and bigger sections, and then right. you'd start cutting people. Like ten o'clock, to, it's dead. Two people go home, and I'd close down. So you have the more bills you get, the more money you make. Yeah. Okay. But then I went into management because that's just me who I am, and I lost all that money. <laughs> Got right. none of it back. <laughs> none of it. Were you making more money as a manager or less money? Less. Yeah. Making more money as a server. Yeah. yeah. God, okay, the money yeah. was great. And yeah, it's like a cash cow because it's straight into your pocket. Yeah. But and whereas management, you go onto your salary. Yeah. And see in Canada, right? Do you know the right, in, in the US, right? Like you're expected to pay 10% yeah. of the bill. Is it the same situation in Canada or is it a bit different? Yes. And I feel sorry for them because it's set up that way for like there's been times that I've paid for your meal in Canada because you haven't tipped me. And you, your bill's a hundred quid. If you don't hit me, I'm still paying eighteen euro off that bill. Oh. So it, it, there's been times that I've walked out with minus because maybe I had only four tables that day. No one tipped me, and it was like, well, you owe the house twenty quid. So Just, that's how it's set up over there. Okay, so you, so you pay not... back. You have like you have your float, right? And then you, but you pay every 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 bill or every table. You pay back eighteen percent, and it goes to the kitchen goes to whatever um but if you don't make tips you're paying that money back right I and mean, are you getting an hourly salary then as well yeah or? Well, okay. it wouldn't be be it wouldn't be it'd be minimum wage yeah it was like four or six dollars or oh, more. i think i was on 750 dollars i can't remember now that was going back yeah canadian dollars, 2015 right? yeah oh, even worse than spain <laughs> even worse than spain but you got the sun yeah, well, here, look, that's well, come here, that, that, it all like that's why i even say to people like all the experiences in your life they all they all add something to your character, you know, and especially for people looking at their CVs or looking to get employed, how do you stick your neck above the rest uh, or above the rest? Know yourself, know your strengths, know have your story to tell, and people will people hire from people, people buy from people, yeah. you know. With AI coming in, will will be will we all be outdoor? No, because AI is never going to replace the human touch. Yeah. It's the relationship side of things. It's relationship management is huge. Sorry, it's important to be yeah. networking and doing things like this. Hundred percent. And that, when you said to me, "I'm so grateful," I was like, "Yeah, lovely." Yeah, let's get me in front of the camera. Can't wait. <laughs> Your sister was like, "You nervous?" Said, no, because it's just another interview or another chat. Yeah, it's great. You just get used to it, but yeah. it's great. But it's great to get out there and speak to like-minded people and to be in. Even when I go to the secondary schools and talk to the kids, like, and I hate asking them what you want to do because they no, don't know no, what they want to do. Yeah, yeah. And I, but I think that's their own fault for putting that on them. 
you need to know what you want. You don't need to know what you want to do when you're 18. Get out there and work and live and experience and you'll find your way. And if you don't get it through the CEO points, you have the apprenticeship programs. Or if you don't have the apprenticeship programs, you have the territory programs or the, the what are they through the head, uh, what are they called? The fee tech, are they fee tech? The PLC, is it? PLCs. Yeah, yeah. You know, just some, or do a course. Yeah. There's, all, there's so many different avenues that I don't think we were exposed to as kids because we were just told you need to go to college. And if you don't go to college, you're working full time. Yeah. We had not many options back then. Yeah, it's changed. When you were, just out of curiosity, right? when you were growing up, was there a stigma around getting an apprenticeship and not going to college? A stigma about not going to college, yeah, 100%. Okay, yeah. Uh, apprenticeships, I wouldn't have been in the space of construction or in, and that's where I think... Wasn't of interest to you, was No. It? Okay, yeah. No, ask me to put up a shelf, no thanks, I'd rather pay someone. <laughs> ask me to paint the house, no thanks, I'd rather pay someone, because that is just not me, and I know my strengths, yeah. and I wouldn't be good. Um, now, I'd cook it a meal, I'd clean the gaff, no bother, but I can't. I couldn't put up a shelf. Um, but I didn't know anything about apprentices, and I think nowadays the perception has changed, and we have a different view of it, and especially like these mediums now that we're getting the word out there. But my thing was, you do your leaving, if you don't do your, if you, you need to do your junior cert, if right. you don't do your leaving cert, you're working full time. Yeah. You're doing your leaving cert, and when you finish your leaving cert, you're going to college. If you're not going to college, you're working full time. And that was it. Yeah. I don't think I don't even matter that I had any exposure themselves to that in their age, and I, we're just learning from their generations and their generations. So yeah. there wasn't much out there. And even I look at I like I want to put the spotlight on career teachers, career guidance teachers. What are they doing? How are they steering the kids? Are they giving them the options of apprentices? Like, that's why I need to get out to schools to let them know. There's so much option out there for you to do. Try and fail. Try and fail and try and fail. Yeah, because it was actually Daniel, the video actor, said to me last week um, that when he, he was from, he's from Clare. Oh, sorry, Daniel. <laughs> but uh, he's from Clare and he was saying, like, when he was growing up, everything was about getting, you know, if you don't get the points you're leaving, sir, there's a PLC course to get to college. Great. Um, but there was no talk of apprenticeships. Like, no. It was like, don't take an apprenticeship. Get was the there apprenticeships out there, though, at the time? Yeah, there would have been. Like, yeah. Like, craft. There, wouldn't, there wouldn't be as many as there is yes. now, but, like, you know, trades people. But as well, I think we're still recovering right from the last recession 100%. as well. 100%. On the construction sort of Like, leaks. what, 2008, I was 18, and I still remember the queues at the banks for yeah. money going to the ATM. Do you know what I mean? It was crazy. And it was like, you just need to work. Just get out and work or go to college, because if you don't go to college, you won't get a good job, which is stupid. But yeah. it's great to see, I don't know, the age range of Daniel compared to me. I'm 1990. <laughs> but, you know, it's even even for someone to say, go for a PLC. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Just try your best. And I think, you, like, I've failed so many times in my life, but how are you going to learn? You have to fail. And I think the resilience piece in recruitment as well, if you fail, you know not how to do it better the next time. Yeah. No one's perfect. No one's asking you to be perfect, but we're just asking you to try. Yeah, that the the lads that were the the plumbers that we had in, they were saying you actually want them to get it wrong when mm. you're showing someone how to do it, so then they learn from it. 100%. Whereas if they're getting it right all the time, and then they eventually get it wrong, you're kind of like, oh, how what happens? You know, I just, I think we need to uh, we need to embrace and foster a culture of failure. Like I follow Stephen Bartlett, and he talks about that all the time about just wanting to fail because if you don't fail. You won't know. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Fail forward, like that's yes. what they say, right? And I think, especially now in the world of media, that we have so many uh, great insights and leaders and people out there that you could just tap into that knowledge straight away. Yeah, like it's a whole list of people like that. Loads, and he, he, even just books and like the likes of, uh, oh, there's just so many, but you can tap into it. And there's resources out there as well that if you need resources, go and go for it. Because no one's going to come and give it to you. No, no, you have to go look for it. Yeah. Grant, and look, what's next for NCI now with the apprenticeships? Well, we have registrations closing in March. So mm -hmm. um, if you're listening, get on to what the website. It will be the end. 30 days of September, if you don't know about 31. Grant. Here we go. Okay, so I'll try to get this out before then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so we've, we finish up now again. Come here. If there is any late applicants, just, you know, uh, go on the website. Look for my contact details and contact me. We, tr we, we try and not have any barriers in front of people. We want everyone to be to, to get it right. Um, so registration closes at the end of March. Um, candidate details will be going to employers in April, hoping to get the employers employing from May onwards. Yeah. And then a uh, new academic year starts 2024. Yeah, brilliant. So it's looking good. The future is bright. We've got fantastic talent. 
you know, it's it's on the the people coming through and like just even to just give you a few stats from I, I never mentioned. We in some people are afraid of, with the myths and all about apprentices about um retention and will they leave. Yeah. We have eighty eight percent retention rate. So that what that means is when you graduate on the data that we have over the last seven years, eighty eight percent of people are still with the current employer. Okay, that's good. Sixty five percent have received internal promotions. Um, and we have an, in the financial ninety eight percent people still in the financial industry. So even if you leave the the in the, the employer, you're still in the industry. So we're launching careers in the industry. We're yeah. not just you know we're not just uh, propping people up just to get them a degree. We're la we're launching careers. We're launching future leaders. People are coming through our doors with the data that we have are going on to huge successes. We had a girl, Tois Vargas, who's won um, an industry award outside of ourselves. We've had a gent called uh, Shaquille, who was uh, voted Generation Apprentice in the financial services sector for Ireland. Mm. In, in recruitment, we had Kerry Lynn Stein. She went on and won a global undergraduate award at the World Economic Forums. Jeez. So like we, the education is powerful. The people that we have coming to our doors is powerful and we're literally launching careers and it's a great space to be in. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, It's also, I think one of the lads that actually encouraged me to go to college when I was in the army was Liam Harris. And he's like, he said like education is the great equalizer as well, right? 100%. So it definitely creates opportunity. Mm. It, it puts onus on yourself to, to, to challenge your own thoughts and perceptions and to push yourself because no one's going to make you study, no one's going to make you put that assignment in, no one's going to get the results that you want at the end only yourself. Yeah. So it kind of gives you, gives you a push to do it. Great. Brilliant. Thanks Lovely. very much for coming in. Thanks much for appreciate it, Lovely.